So in Exodus chapter 3, there's the story of Moses when he sees the burning bush. And notice what it says. He says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him, called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. I mean, you'd be kind of, wouldn't that be fascinating if God said, Kim, Kim, you know, I'm like, oh boy. Uh, and uh, that'd be interesting to hear the voice of the Lord. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not c- come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Because Scripture teaches us, if you looked at the Lord, you would die. So he didn't want to look at him. So in this story, I, I find something fascinating here is uh, we're going to talk tonight about God is with us. And when I say God is with us, that's what he's fixing to tell Moses, that I'm going to be with you. He sends him on a really difficult mission that none of us could dream of ever getting a mission like this. And then he tells him, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, it's, it doesn't mean I'm just going to be there. We all know God is everywhere all the time at the same time. And he's not saying that I'm just going to be there. What he's telling God, uh, God is telling him is that we're not always, first of all, aware of the presence of God. He is everywhere all the time at the same time, but we're not always aware that he's actually there. We don't pay enough attention to it. And he, he was, certainly wasn't. And he saw this bush and it was burning. And I want you to imagine when he saw this burning bush, if he would have just, you know, it probably wasn't the only bush that ever caught fire. And he looks at the bush and you would just go, okay, well, and you look away. And, but he probably looked back. And what would you expect if he looked back a little bit? The bush would be burned. But it wasn't. That would make me a little curious. And he wanted to go see that. Now, I want you to notice something, that he's going to come into the presence of the Lord. And it wasn't at church. You know, there's some people think the Lord only shows up at church. You know, you hear people, boy, wasn't the Lord there this morning? Did you feel the presence of God in the house? You know, this wasn't in church. This was while he was at work. He was at work. Watching sheep. You know, and that tells us something, that God is always around us, no matter whether we're at work or or wherever we're at, he's there. And he goes and he meets the Lord, and of course the Lord's going to give him a real big job to go deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And I want you to look down at verse number 10. He says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. And so he calls him to do an incredible work. And so what it means, this is what I want you to understand. When he talks about his presence, I'm going to be with you. It doesn't mean I'm just going to be there. What God is telling us is, and you have to really understand this, that the purpose of him telling Moses that he's there is, is God is telling him, all of the power that I have will be available and used to help you to carry out what I have called you to do. That's the purpose of the presence of God, is to let you know that God is there to enable you to do everything that God has called you to do. To do His will and to carry out your purpose in your life. And all of us have a little different, slightly little different purpose and roles that we play. And so this is what's going on. We benefit from the focus of God when we, and this is real important too, when we focus on God's will and purpose for our lives. Sometimes we, we want God's presence and sometimes 
we really kind of follow along with the prosperity people. You know about those people? That when God shows up, you don't get sick. You don't get poor. You know, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. It is a sign of God's approval on your life that everything is good. You can be your best self. If you watch TV, you know who says that. You can be your best self. That is not the purpose of the presence of God. Sometimes the pres- in Moses' case, did it mean he was about to live a life of ease, comfort, and enjoyment? No, he was going to face all kinds of things. Uh, how many of you have been around a bunch of grumbling people? How would you like to be around a few million of them? I, I, I can't imagine that. And, and, and then when God wanted to strike them dead one time, the Lord Moses interceded, said, no, 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 kill them. If you feel like you need to kill somebody, just go ahead and kill me. With all those grumbling people, I would have said, go right ahead. You know, the presence of God is there to help you do his will and to carry out his purpose. And ultimately, all of his will and his purpose is to bring him glory. And of course, we're reminded of in in Romans chapter 8, right after Paul talks about suffering, the Christian suffering, he says, all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you read what the purpose is, it's to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ and it's not easy to get there. It will involve some unpleasant things along the way, but the Lord will be there to help you through all of that. So I want to spend a little time on this topic. So uh, I want to fast forward a little bit, turn to chapter 32 of Exodus and this is a little bit further ahead. And in chapter 32, remember he, he, he brings the plagues. The plagues come. He leads them out of uh, Egypt. And they go out into the desert. And they're roaming around. They're headed towards Mount Sinai. And they finally get to Mount Sinai. And what do you think Moses is thinking? I got it done. This is what God told him to do. He said to go get the children of Israel and bring them to Mount Sinai. So he brings them to Mount Sinai, and then he tells them to wait, and he goes up the mountain to get what? The Ten Commandments. So he goes up to Mount Sinai, and he goes up to meet the Lord, and he gets up there, and he's just excited. I mean, can you imagine how excited Moses must have been? He goes up there, and he watches God's finger write the Ten Commandments on the tablets. Can you imagine that? I had an Old Testament professor one time, he, he had Moses carrying the, both of those down the mountain and, and the, the caption over it said, man, I sure be glad when he's come out in paperback. <laughs> and, and, but he's all excited, and, but his excitement ends when what happens? He gets down near the, bo- near the end of the mountain, and what does he see? There's the children of Israel taking the things that they took from Egypt, and what were those things supposed to be used for? The construction of the tabernacle. And what did they do with it? They made a golden calf. And Aaron was the one who did it. And they were doing all kinds of things that are unspeakable. How many of you think Moses came down out of the mountain happy now? He was angry. He threw down the tablets. Thousands of them were killed. And that's what happened in chapter 32. But, and what did God want to do to him? He wanted to kill them all. He was going to wipe Israel out. And you'll find in the chapter there, it says that Moses interceded on, on behalf of all of them and said, look, you know, if you need to kill somebody, just kill me. And the Lord didn't. He didn't want to kill him, so he relented, and they survived. And so there they are at Sinai, and he's stuck with these people. And then what does the Lord tell him to do? Look at chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
saying to your offspring, I will give it. So they're supposed to go to the promised land that God gave Abraham. And what does Moses do before he goes? Well, he's a little shaky right now. The Lord said he would go with him, didn't he? And this is not going the way he expected it to go. He thought when he got to Sinai, everything was going to be great. And it didn't turn out to be great. And so if he's thinking, we went all the way from Egypt to here to this catastrophe, and God tells him to go somewhere else, and he's probably thinking, wonder what's waiting over there. And so he wants to make sure that the Lord is still with him. He doesn't want to go unless he's sure that the Lord wants him to go and that he'll be with him. So he set up this device called the tent of meeting. Look at verse 7. It says, Now Moses used to, used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each one would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud that was about to lead them by day and night would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. Now, if you were one of the Israelites, I'm sure they backed up. They didn't want to get too near that. But he's inside the tent, and he says, And the Lord would speak with Moses, and when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speak to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp and his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. So there's Moses and here's Joshua and they're inside the tent. Now watch what happens here. Moses said to the Lord, see you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. In other words, I don't want to go alone. I don't want to go by myself. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you. This is what the Lord says to him. My presence will go with you. Same thing he said at the burning bush. And I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. I won't go unless you are with me. I bet there are a lot of Christians over time wish they had said that. They do things without waiting for the Lord sometimes. He says, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? So he's not feeling too good about himself. And he says, I and your people, is it not in your going with us that we are distinct? I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. In other words, the only way God people are going to know that we're Israel, that you're, we're your chosen people, is that you are present with us, that you're with us. And you're helping us to carry out whatever it is you've called us to do. You know, the way that people should be able to recognize the people of God is not how big our buildings can get, not how big our budgets can get, not all of the statistics that go with church, but they should have this idea that God is with us, that he's present with us. And I think that's important. I remember many, many years ago... Uh, I experienced what I'm talking about. So it was about 1989, 1990. I had finished uh, graduating from Bible college, and I was thinking about going to seminary, but I found a lot of reasons not to go. Most of them were I was afraid to fail. The statistics of how many people get into the ministry and succeed is very small. That made me afraid. 
My first year in college, I was so afraid of the ministry that I got papers together to go back into the military to continue my military career. My wife found them and tore them up. I went and did it the second time and she tore them up. I gave up at that point. So I was scared and I was working part-time at Sears and uh, we were about to have our, our youngest child and uh, I was really, really working hard, throwing two newspaper routes and working part-time and preaching on the weekends and, and I was busy and I would go to work and I, I got to be real good friends with my boss, Frank Ham was his name. And uh, we started, uh, I would tell him why I can't go to seminary. Give him all these excuses. What did I want to really want to know? I wanted to know that if I went, the Lord would go with me. Because that means he's for me. And he's going to help me get this done. I wanted to know that, and I didn't know that. I would pray, Lord, do you want me to go to seminary? Guess what? He didn't say nothing. I even had three good seminaries picked out. I said, we're going to play this game, Lord. A, B, C. He didn't want to play. And so I just complained, and I complained. And one day, Frank, who's not a Christian at all, looked at me, and he said, Kim, just go. And I said, why do you say that, Frank? Frank? I've watched you for two years. Everything works out for you. And then I realized when he said that, this man who wasn't even a Christian recognized that God was present in my life. And I went as a result of that. And I think that's a great cause of why I made it for 35 years. And so he wants to know, are you going to go with me, Lord? Well, uh, he, he, wants to, he wants to just kind of make sure. So guess what he asked God to do? Not something little. He said, um, um, God gave him another mission. You got to get the second, the second edition of the Ten Commandments. So he said, cut two, two tablets, and lug them up the top of the mountain. And when you get up there, you know, I'll use my hand and write, write them out again. But he says, oh, by the way, when I get up there, could I see your glory? That way I'll I'll really know that I have found favor in your sight. He wanted to know if if he had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, God sort of partially fulfilled what he wanted, but he said, no, you can't actually look at me because if you look at me, what will happen? You'll die. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you see my glory. So he put him in what we call the cleft of the rock, and the glory of the Lord passes by, and he got to see the the hindsight, the backside. I don't know what it was he saw, but it must have been really something, because when he came down from the mountain, guess what his face looked like? Nobody could look at him. And from then on, every time he went into the tent of meeting and he came out, his face shone, and it was so bright, he started to put a veil on it so people could look at him. And that brightness that was on his face testified to what? That the Lord was with him. His presence was always there with Moses. I think that's something important when a church calls a person to be an elder or calls a person to be uh, a pastor in a church is a crucial question is, is the Lord with this person? Not just can they preach or can they do certain things, but is the Lord with them? So he, fought, he, he, he goes up to Sinai, he cuts the tablets, he brings them up, he experiences the glory of the Lord, and look at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 34. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. So go with us. And he did go with them. Turn with me real quick to Joshua chapter 1. After he dies, Joshua, who went into the tent of meeting also, he says kind of the same thing to Joshua. Now, Joshua's got a pretty big job to do. He's supposed to go into the 
children into the Israel, and he's supposed to what do what? What's his command? Kill them or drive them out? How many of them? All of them. That's what he's supposed to do. I heard a preacher actually preach a sermon on this and said Joshua was a great soul winner. I thought, that's kind of strange. He was called to kill, not save. This is his great job to do. And it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the uh, the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, and he tells him to take the children of Israel over into the land of Canaan. And then he says in verse six uh, or verse five, look at verse five: No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, which he saw. So I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. This is requoted in Hebrews thirteen five. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Then he tells them near the end in verse number 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He was with Joshua. We could go on all the way through the Bible. God was with David. Many of the psalms, remember there's one psalm and David says stuff like this. If I were to go to the depths of the sea, that's, you'd be there. If I went to the tallest mountain, you'd be there too. If I went to Hades, there, you'd be there too. Wherever I would go, you would be there. There's nowhere to run from the Lord. He'll be there wherever you happen to go. And what about the 23rd psalm? How's that go? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But he also says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. Because you're with me. He learned that all through his life. That God had been with him all of those years. Now, there's a lot in the Old Testament about God's presence with people. But one of the things that's interesting, we find David actually said this one time. He pleaded with the Lord not to take his spirit away from him. Not for his presence to depart from him. That's not something any of us need to fear. You know why? Because in John chapter 14 and verse 26, turn with me there. John 14 verse 26 And now I'm going to give you something that's true of all of us. You think all these people are great? Well, the Lord's with all of us just like he was with them. John 14, verse number 6. Look what it says. 26, excuse me. He says, uh, These things have I spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. The Helper... And in the Greek word, it's that word paraclete. And guess what that means? One who walks alongside. Jesus also said in his instructions to the disciples that when he comes, he will be with you forever. So we have the assurance that God is always walking alongside of us. I, I know you've seen the, you know, the stuff where you, know, you, know, you see the footprints in the sand and it's God's footprints. That's not technically correct with Scripture. He walks alongside. So you'll have his foot, feet print maybe in yours too, but he's walking alongside of us all of the way to help us carry out God's plan for our lives. Not only that, back in uh, David's day, the place that he loved the most was the temple and the tabernacle because the temple was the place where God's presence was. All Israel went up there to experience the presence of God. But the Bible tells us that because of the Holy Spirit's coming, our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's, that's pretty close, you think? 
He's walking alongside. He is in us. We are the temple of God. So we're actually, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, we're a little more blessed than Moses was because of that. In 2 Corinthians, I don't have time to read the whole thing, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about the experience that Moses had, this external glory that was on his face, but we have something even greater. If you look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, since, in verse 12, says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. We're talking about Jewish unbelievers. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So there's a couple things I want you to see. There's a lot of things there, but I just want to see a couple things. Number one, how many of you realize that the Holy Spirit is the one that opened your eyes to the gospel? How many of you heard the gospel and, and didn't get saved at least once, twice, three times? Statistics say it's at least five or six. Why the one time and not the others? Did you improve? Did you just fix yourself? Did you enlighten your mind? No. No. The second Corinthians tells us later on in verse 14 that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. He can't welcome them because they're spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit comes by and visits us, and when he comes by, he opens our hearts. He opens our minds. He illuminates us, and we can see the gospel. And it's not dark. It's not veiled. It's not hidden. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, talks about that the gospel is, is veiled, it's hidden to those who are lost. And Satan wants to keep it that way. And it takes someone more powerful than the devil to uncover and, re, and, and get rid of that darkness, and that is the Holy Spirit. We should be very thankful for the work of the Spirit. Not only does he do that, look what else it says. Beholding the glory of the Lord. We don't have to go into the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord is inside of us. And we can read the Word of God and we can see the glory of the Lord and it transforms us into the same image. Now, I learned this when I first got saved. So when I got saved, I, there was no church involved. Nobody ever visited my house or my trailer. Nobody. Nobody came by to preach the gospel. I got saved watching Billy Graham on TV set. And... The moment I got saved, I became a voracious reader of Scripture. I mean, my mom would come in like, you going to bed? Why? What? It's 2 o'clock in the morning, you got to go to school. I just wanted to read the Bible, read the Bible. Guess what I noticed as I read the Bible? I wasn't even trying to do this. I was changing. I used to be known back in those days a man, as a man, a boy with a, a very, very limited vocabulary. Catch my drift? They're not words you can repeat in church. I got a few technical fouls in basketball. Because if you notice, my voice is kind of loud, so my whispers get heard by the officials. And uh, I would get teed up and then the coach would put me on the bench so I didn't get thrown out of the game and uh, let me calm down, then I'd go back in. But I, I did. And you know what? It's almost helped me to get saved because I decided one day that this was not good, so I decided I'm going to stop cussing. I got worse. The more I tried to not cuss, the more I cussed. I cussed because I couldn't stop cussing. 
And it actually helped when I heard the gospel to get under conviction. The Holy Spirit opened my mind. I got saved. And I started reading the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit began to change me. And I began to change and change and change. And that's the secret. If you, People say, well, I need to change. Read more scripture. Spend more time with God. You know, don't fall for this thing. You can spend 10 minutes with God and everything will be okay. Right? I mean, can you imagine if the, your favorite television show came on, they had 50 minutes of commercials and 10 minutes of show? You'd be all right with that? You know, we can watch a show for an hour and it doesn't bother us. And people will act like, oh my gosh, i got to read the Bible for a whole hour. Are you kidding? I used to get to do this for a living, four or five hours a day. I loved it. And we study the scripture and, and we begin to change. Why is that? Because the presence of God is in us through the Holy Spirit. And that changes us. Let me give you some of the blessings of the presence of God that will really help you. And you, this is something like Moses, you've got to notice. Listen to me, you've got to notice. You've got to pay attention that he's there. You know, we're so busy with life, we're not fully understanding that he's always there. We're not sensing his presence in our life. So the first thing I'll say about the blessings of the presence of God is it's very destructive to fear. How many of you are afraid of anything? How many of you are pretty sure nothing negative is going to happen in your future? How many of you are pretty certain that nothing bad will happen? You are always going to be healthy. And everybody you know is going to be healthy. I know one person in this room, no, that's not true because she sends out prayer requests all the time. I got one today. How many of you realize something's going to happen? And it's going to be negative, right? Fear can get a hold of you. I grew up in a home with seven dads by the time I was, you know, out of high school. And uh, I was, I dreaded the next day of my life. Every day I dreaded it. What terrible thing is going to happen now? And that didn't change until I got a hold of understanding the presence of God means I don't have to fear anything. Because he's in control of all of it, including the wicked. This only works when our focus on life is the hope, not of prosperity theology, of theology, but the, that the presence of God is focused on the will of God and the purpose of God. So if I have to go through this, and I've gone through a lot of terrible things at church as a pastor, you go through this stuff, and when you go through that stuff, you have to learn that God has a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. It's for my good and his glory. And when I'm focused on his will and his glory, however, when I'm fearful, guess who I'm mostly focused on? Me. We tend to talk about it to other people. But fear will fall when we realize that God is present with us. Remember the disciples? They were scared to death. They were going to drown out in the sea. Guess what they forgot? They forgot who was asleep underneath. If they'd have known that, he's the same guy that raised the dead, healed the blind, made everybody who was sick healthy again. He did miracle after miracle after miracle. They would never would have been afraid as a result of that. He's the same guy who walked on the water. Man, I think I could trust somebody who can walk on the water, Amen. I really could. Everybody picks on Peter. I don't know why. He was the only one I noticed got out of the boat. And he would have been okay if he had just kept his eyes on the Lord, but he had to look around and fear got a hold of him. Our holiness also depends upon the presence of God. Now watch, listen to this. In Isaiah chapter 6, this is the holiest man in the entire nation. There's nobody holier in the whole nation except Isaiah. But he has a vision and he comes into the presence of the Lord. And guess what he suddenly feels? Very, very sinful. He suddenly realized, and in fact he says, I got the dirtiest mouth in the nation. 
I got a dirty mouth. Because he experienced the fear of the Lord. People don't want that anymore. They, they love sermons on the love of God, but none about the fear of God. The world's going to experience that when he comes back the second time. First time he came to save, he's not coming back to save the second time. He's going to be mad. And it, it promotes a, a fear of the Lord, and as a result, when we have the fear of the Lord, we sin less and we obey more. Now, I want you to imagine this I'm here on a practical level. So today, I think this item is, can be mo- one of the most helpful things on the face of the earth, but it can be one of the most dangerous things on the face of the earth. Anybody know what, which one I'm, talk, what I'm talking about? People sit behind it for a long time. Computers. And people who sit in church often look at things they shouldn't be looking at. Every day for hours. Parents don't even realize there are 13-year-olds doing it. How many of you would uh, be looking at something or saying something or doing something if Pastor Matt happened to be standing there watching? You wouldn't do it, would you? If there's somebody greater than Pastor Matt, could you imagine if the Lord was standing there watching you on your computer or your cell phone? or in your conversations with other people. Can you imagine that? Or when you're driving, you know, you know when you're driving and praising the Lord the entire time? You know, would you imagine, what if Jesus was in the passenger seat? I mean, can you say what? Did you just bless that guy? You know, that stuff goes on all the time. It's amazing. That's how holiness works is when we have an idea that the Lord is actually really there. And He actually is. We just don't see Him with our eyes. A third thing about the presence of God is you experience a great understanding of God's love for you that you may not get anywhere else. And it's because of this. It also says that when the Holy Spirit comes... It says, he will be with you, how long? Forever. That means he will be forever with you when you are at your worst. You know, when you're at home with your spouse and y'all are praising the Lord together, you've been facetious here. Can you imagine the Lord's watching that? Can you, If you would imagine the Lord was watching what you do at your house with your family, you might behave a little differently. But no matter when you're at your worst, He still loves you. He's not leaving. He's not leaving. This means as much to me as anything because almost everybody that I've ever experienced in my life, most people always leave me. All the stepdads leave. My mother left me several times. As a pastor, people tell me they cannot live without me, and then they have to leave. Sometimes they don't even say goodbye. Or they write me a Dear John letter, you know, Dear Pastor letter, and tell me why they can't come anymore. And stuff like that. Now it's, it, they don't give you Dear John letters, it's a Dear John text, you know. Enjoyed all the great sermons, bye. And that's what they do. And people just leave you over and over and over and over again. You experience how much God really loves you. And then you can also experience joy. Joy that is not dependent on circumstances. Psalm 1611 says, at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, 
we have a sense of the presence of God, joy comes, and joy is something that is not dependent on circumstances. How many have ever been joyful when the circumstances were awful? I used to have this friend when I was in the army. I didn't like him because he was really good with this trait. No matter how bad it was, no matter what we went through, we'd go out in the field, be 105 degrees at Fort Hood. Everybody would leave. There was nobody with any race out there because we were all caked with the same stuff. It was just miserable. Chiggers, flies. I mean, it was just miserable out there. And he'd just walk around with his little New Testament. Well, bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. You know, I'm like, shut up. And he did that no matter what. And joy is something that we can have when we enjoy the presence of God. Jesus told that to his disciples. My joy I give unto you. And he said that right before he went to the cross. And then, here's what I like. You don't have to be saved like 20 years for this to happen. You can enjoy the presence of God without any spiritual training whatsoever. Starting the day you get saved. Remember after I got saved, I used to go out to this rock pile. This wasn't just any rock pile. I lived in Folsom, California. These rock piles were put out there by people in the 18, early 1850s who were looking for gold. This is where gold was discovered. And I would go out there where these people were there in those days, and I went out there and I met with the Lord. They were sweet times. Didn't require any spiritual training. Now, let me give you real quick the hindrances to the presence of God. This is why we don't enjoy it as much as we should. This is number one. I've got them in order of how terrible they are. Excessive thoughts about yourself. Who do you think about the most? You ever thought about that? I mean, you want to have a little fun? Just spend a week, take a little inventory of the amount of time you spend thinking about yourself. How many of you know people who talk about themselves all the time? And why do they talk about themselves all the time? Because they think about themselves all the time. Do you know all the people who think about themselves too excessively? They're the people who have anxiety, depression, and all kinds of problems. Quit staring at yourself, and you might, you'd be better off staring at the Lord, amen? Amen than staring at yourself. Excessive thoughts about self. And guess what? Our world today, from the time they are in school, the schools are obsessed with pounding our kids with all this emotional garbage. Immature brains that are not fully matured yet, and they are hit with stuff that adults can't even handle. And they have emotional problems. No kidding. I don't remember being a kid having to decide whether I'm a boy or a girl. And now I don't think they can do that now because there's no such thing. I don't know what the choices they're giving them. But some of the stuff is just absolutely crazy. But they focus on their emotional problems all of the time. Have you ever sat around and talked with a depressed person? It's depressing. It really is. You know, because it's just, you know, it's like the hee-haw show. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark, depression, excessive misery. And people do that. And that's, fe- that's what we call fear. They do that. Another one is, is the fa- failure to focus on God's will and our purpose in life. Instead, we get worldly. And a lot of times, you know what Christians do? We kind of do get focused on avoiding unpleasant things and enjoying things. I see this on Facebook. My Christian friends on Facebook, they like to put on Facebook their latest trip, their latest fun. This was a great time. You know, they they do that. I got a few, though, that put their depression on there, stuff like that. But they put stuff like that on there. And they're not focusing on God's will and our purpose in life. And listen, if you want to be successful in the Christian life, your feelings are irrelevant. Your obedience is what's needed. That's discipline. That's faith. It's to do what God tells you to do even if you don't feel like it. I've done, had that happen many, many times. 
And then the next one is a failure to listen to the Lord. You don't experience the presence of God if you don't listen to the Lord. How many of your parents have experienced that your children suddenly did not acknowledge your presence? Clean your room. It's like you're not there. I, I tell my son when he's, you know, I always had to tell him twice usually. And he, I said, take the trash out, son. He's just going around like I'm not even there. He didn't hear anything. He's not acknowledging my presence. He's not experiencing the presence of dad, but he's about to. Then my voice would change to the drill sergeant voice. Son, are you telling me that I will not take out the trash? Give me some eye-to-eye -eye contact. Guess what? He moved instantly because suddenly my presence was felt. And sometimes we don't listen to the Lord. How do we listen to the Lord? Read the scriptures. Come to church and hear the word preached. Pray. I mean, realize that God works in your life through prayer. Prayer is not about you changing God's mind. Prayer is about God changing your mind. Am I right, Ron? It changes your mind so that you pray things that are in step with Him. That's what happens. And so we need to listen to the Lord. Listen to Him. D.L. Moody said, a lost person said, well, I've never heard the Lord. And he dropped a quarter on the sidewalk. The guy stopped instantly and turned to look. and says, depends on what you're listening for. He was listening for money. And then number, the last one I have here is excessive busyness. Some people are just too busy to notice the Lord's presence. Just too busy. You know, I know people in church, they signed up for 10 things. You're too busy. I always wonder, why do you want to do 10 things bad? Why don't you do two things well? You know, but they do too much. They're always trying to do too much. There's, they're busy, 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 busy. Workaholics. You just slow down a little bit and notice the Lord. How many of you have ever seen this? There are people, I noticed, I went to the Grand Canyon one time. I always, my wife wanted to go there. I didn't want to go there. I said, oh, it's a stupid hole in the ground. And she said, oh, I, well, we got to go. So our 25th wedding anniversary, I flew out there. And we, you know, we, if you ever drive up to the Grand Canyon, you don't realize it's just going to suddenly be on you. I mean, you get to the, the stop sign and there it is. And I, I stopped and then they are honking like, get out of the way, it's stupid. And I pulled in the parking lot, I went over there and I go, wow, that's a hole. I mean, there are no holes like that. But you know, there's people that live all around there and never notice the Grand Canyon. When I live near Chicago, people come from all over the world to see Chicago. I do not know why. It's a great place to be shot. But they come to Chicago all the time, and they go to Chicago, and I live right there, and I never once went up the Sears Tower. I don't like high places anyway. This is, as high, this is about as high as I ever would want to go. Excessive business, just slow down a little bit. So as I close this evening, fear dominated my life, I think, in the first three years. I've told you that. But we need to practice the presence of God, and I think that keeps us going. There are times in your life, I think, where you do feel the Lord very close to you, but He always is. And how many of you want the Lord to be close to you? Is that everybody? You want me to tell you how to do it? James tells us exactly how to do it. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. The more you pursue the Lord, the more he will come near you, and the more you will sense his presence in your life. Moses first experienced that while he was at work. You can experience God's presence everywhere. How many of you used to sing with hymn books. Remember that? I remember hymn books. Remember those? 
Uh, now, don't get me on a thing. I had somebody come and say, don't you wish we had that book? No, I don't see as well as I used to, so the screen is fine for me. I don't really care one way. We don't sing Southern gospel music, so I, I never get my way around here, so I'm just good with whatever. But there are some very well-known authors in the hymn books wrote a lot of songs. Name some of them. Can you think of any? I'm thinking of a woman. Fanny Crosby. Did you know many of the hymns that Fanny Crosby were written while she was doing housework? While she was doing housework. She sensed the presence of God while she did her housework. And we've been singing her songs for an awful long time. Isn't that something? And so we need to, I think it's important that we practice the presence of the Lord. This is not a popular sermon, it's not an easy sermon, but it is something you need to be aware of all of the time. I, I want to close with this thought. So I, I all the years I was a pastor, we have so much work to do. And uh, everybody has something for us to do. But every day I started the same way. Whether it was at home or whether it was the office. But I started the same way. You know why? It was to go to the office or to my study in my home. And I spent time with the Lord. Whatever time it took. On Thursdays, unless you were dying, you better not be lying to me when you did, when you tell me. I was not to be disturbed. I spent the day with the Lord, making sure I was fully ready to preach on Sunday. I wanted to be with the Lord. It was important to me to have the presence of God in my work and in my life than it was the actual work I had to do. This was what was important to me. And whenever I would get to a place where it was starting to impede a little bit on my time with the Lord, I would tell the church, find someone else to do that other stuff. I would outsource it so that I could keep my time with the Lord. And now, one of the great things about my life is, being retired, is I have a lot of time to be with the Lord. You know, every email I get gets an instantaneous work over to pray for whoever that person is. But I'm praying for many of them. I don't even know who they are, but I pray for them. That's what we need to do, amen? What would our lives be like if we knew the Lord was with us and walking with us? It'd be a lot less absent of some stuff and a lot more of good stuff. And what would it do to our church? If the only person that walked with the Lord wasn't our staff, but it was us too. Wouldn't that be awesome? If that was the case. This is what I want to bring to you tonight. So God's faithful. God's holy. God loves. God is present in every moment of your life in the good and the bad and he's there for you to focus on bringing him glory and doing his will amen let's close in prayer